The moment of receiving Holy Communion for the first time is an extremely important moment in everyone's life. And most of us, when we see someone else make their first communion, it makes us remember our own. And it makes us remember the, the sentiments of joy and wonder that we experienced on that beautiful day ourselves. And what better time of year could we celebrate an occasion like this than during the octave of the Feast of the Blessed Sacrament itself, of Corpus Christi. So let us think about that mystery today. Why did our Lord want to stay with us in the Holy Eucharist until the end of time? It was so we could receive him in communion, as these children are doing today for the first time, and so that he could feed, us our, feed our souls so that he could nourish us by his presence and, and by this union with our souls. So it's something we should be thinking about today, this beautiful mystery. In order for us to get as much benefit as possible from Holy Communion, though, we have to have the right dispositions. The first and essential disposition that we need to have to receive Holy Communion, of course, is the state of sanctifying grace. If we're not in sanctifying grace, when we receive Holy Communion, then we commit a very serious mortal sin, that we commit a sacrilege. It's good for us to have a great love of God and, and great love of, of virtue too, but if we're not on a high level of virtue, at the very least, we should have a great desire to be virtuous and to be as holy as possible in the sight of God. It's unfortunate that, that a lot of times people go to Holy Communion sort of half-heartedly with only a very faint idea of who they're receiving. This is a fault that we're all prone to. But in order to avoid it, let's, let's think today about the conditions that we need to have for Holy Communion. So, of course, after being in sanctifying grace, the next most important condition is that we have a great desire to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Our Lord comes to us under the appearance of food because he's the food of our souls. So it's helpful to think about this comparison to get a better idea of how we should receive Holy Communion. With food for our bodies, in order for us to be able to eat and nourish ourselves, we have to be hungry. We have to have a desire for food if we don't want to starve to death. The act of eating by itself is something that takes time and work. We have to digest our food and that makes us tired and sometimes might even give us a stomach ache. And so because of that, God in his goodness gave us the appetite to want food and to want the nourishment that our bodies need. And he's made food taste good to us so that it would be easy for us to eat the food that we need. <clears throat> In the same way with Holy Communion, there's a hunger for Holy Communion and for our Lord that we need to have. And just like with our bodies, the more hungry we are for food and the better it is or the more, rather, the more we need the food, and, and the better the food is for us when we receive it. In the same way, in the spiritual order, the greater the desire we have to receive our Lord, the more graces we receive when he comes into our souls. But if we don't have any desire to receive our Lord, then when we receive him, it won't do us any good. And we might even end up worse off, just like if... We have no appetite for food, and, and we, we put food into our stomachs in any case, it, it will probably make us sick. So God has given us this hunger for him in Holy Communion, that if we didn't have, we would never receive him. And there is such a vast difference between us and God that we on our own would never dare to receive communion if the grace of God didn't give us this hunger this desire for our Lord that makes us come up to the communion rail to receive him. 
and this hunger that makes us forget about the infinite dignity of our Lord, and that makes us focus only on the need that we have to receive Him and, and to receive His graces. God makes us forget about our own misery and, and look only at His goodness, and so that we can forget about who we are and receive this nourishment to our souls. In a sense, this is true of everything that we do. Mankind lives by desire. Everything that we do, as a general rule, is something that, that we want to do. Almost everything that we do all day long is in order to get something that we want or avoid something we don't want. And the same is true of Holy Communion, that we have this desire to receive our Lord that God gave us so that we wouldn't be afraid of our sins and afraid of, of receiving our judge and of receiving the infinitely holy God. And that is why our Lord gave us this hunger for himself, because he knew that, that otherwise it would be too difficult for us to receive him. But someone might be thinking to himself, I really don't feel all that great of a desire to receive our Lord. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, for someone who never receives communion at all, it's possible that they might not have any interest in, in receiving our Lord, someone who is, is buried in sin and, and has no wish to change. Someone like that might not have any desire to receive our Lord at all. But if we do receive communion, it, that means that, that we want to do so. Because, as I said, whenever we do anything, it's because we want to, on some level at least. And that desire that we have that causes us to approach the altar is something God has given us so that we would nourish our souls. And the more we receive Holy Communion well, and with the right dispositions, the more hungry we become. And conversely, the less we receive Holy Communion and with worse and worse dispositions, we'll tend to have less and less desire. But there is one form of desire for Holy Communion that we can always have, regardless of the state of our virtue or our love of God. And that is very similar to the desire that, that a sick person has to go to the doctor or someone who is lost in the desert, their desire for a drink of water. All of us can look at our own misery and sinfulness and have a great desire to receive communion as the remedy of our problems. Let us imagine someone who has been in the state of, of mortal sin for a long time, who has only just gone to confession and only just gotten back on the straight and narrow and is having a, a very difficult time avoiding mortal sin. Someone like that should come to Holy Communion and say to our Lord, feed me because I am starving. I don't have the strength to walk in the path of virtue because I haven't been on it for so long. So give me the food that I need to have the strength to persevere. And that sentiment is very pleasing to our Lord. It shows confidence in Him. It honors Him. It exalts Him. And at the same time, it shows a true understanding that we should have of our own unworthiness and our own weakness. And that is always an attitude that we need to have when we are approaching God on any level, but especially in, in the intimacy of the Holy Sacrament. And it opens us up to receive God's graces. We see this lesson in the parable in the Gospel today, not in, in, not in the Gospel of the Feast of Corpus Christi, but in the Gospel of the second Sunday after Pentecost, which we'll read instead of the Gospel of St. John at, at the end of Mass today. This is the parable of the king who prepared a glorious marriage feast and invited all of his guests, and none of them wanted to come. So he sent his servants out into the highways and the byways to bring all the, the poor and the crippled and the lame and all those sorts of people from the roadways into this feast. 
And as each one of these, these poor people came into the banquet hall, he wasn't expected to bring a, a wedding gift, of course, because these people were very poor. But he was expected to put on a beautiful garment that was given to him by the ministers of the king. And when the king came into the feast, he was happy to see all these, these poor beggars with such joy on their faces until he saw the one man who didn't have on a wedding garment, who had refused to put it on, who had wanted to stay in his rags. And this was a terrible insult to the king, and so he threw him out. So this parable represents us, that we are poor and blind and lame, and we are invited to this beautiful feast where we are given the most glorious food that our souls could have. We are there at the feast, and this great king wants us to be there. We're invited. Even though we aren't rich or beautiful or anything else good in the sight of God. But as long as we come willingly, as these poor people did, and receive this, this sanctifying grace from God and then put on this beautiful garment that God gives us, then we are pleasing to him. And we should have confidence when we receive Holy Communion, even though he knew that we were completely impoverished and without any spiritual treasures of our own, and in fact we are, are crippled and maimed by, by our own sins, our Lord has still invited us to this feast so that he could give us the food that would help to heal our wounds like he did with, with the poor beggars in the roadways. That is what he wants to do for us. And all we have to do is put on this beautiful garment of sanctifying grace. And we have to have the humility and an understanding of our true condition. And we have to be eager to receive the graces that he's giving us. And receive them with desire and with gratitude. But if we do all these things, as our Lord said, we will have life in us, and he will raise us up on the last day. Let us pray for the first communicants today that they will persevere in receiving Holy Communion worthily for their entire lives, so that God's grace will grow in their souls until it reaches its fulfillment in the eternal union with God in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.